All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome everyone across the globe back to today's webinar event, Motors Academy's second webinar series, the summer edition. The theme will be Innovation in Healthcare, Assistive Technologies for Rehabilitation. My name is Jackson, and joining me as a co-host for today's session is Daniela, and we will be going through the second of the four webinars in the series, Telerehabilitation, an innovative model for community care. Thanks, Jackson. Hi, everyone. Daniela here. A very warm welcome to our second webinar session of the summer series. I'm very pleased to be here today to host with Jackson as we hear from three different professionals across the world to share their perspectives on telerehabilitation and their expertise. Without further delay, Let's welcome our speakers. Joining us on our panel today, we have Dr. Nupur Hajela. She received her Bachelor's of Physical Therapy degree from Baba Farid University of Medicine and Science, India. She then moved to the US to pursue her PhD in Rehabilitation Science with an emphasis on neuroscience at the University of Minnesota, Minneapolis. She completed two years of postdoctoral fellowship in clinical neurorehabilitation at the sensory motor performance since, uh, program at the prestigious Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, now known as the Schiller and Ryan Ability Lab, affiliated to the Northwestern University of Medicine and Science, Chicago, Illinois, where she incorporated novel brain stimulation technique such as TMS to understand the cortical and spinal mechanisms underlying neuroplastic changes after injury and rehabilitation in the neurological patient population. Dr. Rajela believes in an interprofessional approach to treating patients and therefore is interested in internal and external collaboration for teaching, research, and service. She is a lifelong learner and is currently pursuing a post-professional GPT from Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine and Science, Illinois. She's also an LSVT big certifying physical therapist to treat individuals with Parkinson's disease. Currently, her research focuses on the application of neural gaming in people with concussions, such as war veterans and athletes. Her research interests are in the area of novel brain stimulation, games, and virtual reality for physical and cognitive therapy. Next. We have Dr. Lauren Rashford. She is the Director of Clinical Operations and Customer Development at Motorum Technologies. We hold a she holds a doctorate in physical therapy and brings substantial experience in the neural rehabilitation world, including clinical management and business development roles. With a strong background in both clinical and commercial rehabilitation, she offers expertise in clinical strategy and integration. 
Dr. Lauren has been responsible for clinical operations, building and leveraging clinical partnerships, and delivering current protocols and education to other clinical staff. Additionally, Dr. Lauren will continue to cultivate, build, and maintain relationships that help foster the clinical integration process. But unfortunately, Dr. Lauren could not join us today due to the uh, last minute emergency that she had, but she was kind enough to prepare her presentation on time and we will share that later on. Lastly, we have Dr. Uh, Minus New. He completed his Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering at the Beijing Institute of Technology and Biomedical Engineering in 2006. He then received a PhD in Bioengineering from the University of Illinois at Chicago, specializing in neurorehabilitation, co-advised by the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. From the year of 2010 to 2014, Dr. New completed his postdoctoral training as a research associate at the University of Southern California, Department of Biomedical Engineering, Biokinesiology, and Physical Therapy. His interdisciplinary work has been accepted for oral representation at the ASNR and published in Neuroinformation Processing System, a leading conference proceeding in machine learning. Dr. New joined the Department of Rehabilitation at the Ruijing Hospital as JTU in 2015. His current research focuses on neural control of movements, mechanisms of neurological diseases with movement impairments, and how to apply principles of neurocomputation in neurorehabilitation. Now, we have a good idea of who our speakers are. Let us get started. We welcome questions from the audience. Please type them in the Q&A box below and we'll try our best to keep an eye on them and get our speakers to answer them live. First, let's welcome Dr. Hajila to her presentation on telerehabilitation, an innovative educational model for community care. Hello, good morning, good afternoon and good evening everyone from different parts of the world. It is my privilege and honor to be here and sharing this platform presentation with my esteemed guests. Um, a little bit about myself, and before I do that, let me share my screen and get started. So the topic of my presentation today, uh, obviously it's in the umbrella term of tele-rehabilitation um, in terms of providing community care. And I will be walking through the lens of an educator. I am, um, as Daniela suggested, uh, I'm a neuroscientist by background, but I have a unique perspective being a physical therapist. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in the physical therapy department. I'm the director of rehabilitation uh, technology and outcome research, and also the director of Gate Balance and Mobility Clinic. So I kind of see a very different perspective from a very different point of view, being the director of Gate Balance and Mobility Clinic, where we have patients from spinal cord injury, Parkinson's and stroke, along with peripheral neuropathy coming into the clinic. So in terms of my philosophy, I believe in engaging, enabling, and empowering uh, my people in terms of my students. And it has been an absolute pleasure to be part of this, their journey all along the way and preparing the healthcare task force um, as they learn different skills and techniques. So I'm absolutely fortunate to be in company of some really accomplished professors, researchers, scientists, and I always tell my students that they are my hero because they teach me a lot about resilience. They teach me a lot about hard work. So that is my philosophy in terms of uh, doing what I'm doing currently. So an outline for presentation today, I will be walking through uh, in terms of the overview of what is evidence-based practice in telehealth and tele-rehab. I will be you're interchangeably using telehealth and tele-rehab, um, but uh, obviously in terms of understanding, we'll talk about what it means. 
Then I will move on to what I have learned by providing telehealth physical therapy and how my clinic was one of the success stories that came out during the pandemic where we all transitioned our in-person gait balance and mobility clinic into a telehealth clinic. I'll talk about some of the clinical tools that we have been using and what you can use uh, as part of a virtual neurological examination, because we as physical therapists, as practitioners, we always believe in hands-on skills. And now if you have to translate it into a virtual world, we have to talk about what it means. And finally, I'll talk about what it means to be in virtual reality setting, and then moving on to the interprofessional team member approach in tele-rehab delivery. So in terms of tele-rehabilitation, uh, based on the World Health Organization, it is the telehealth actually means uh, the use of telecommunication and virtual technology to deliver healthcare outside of traditional healthcare facilities. And that's what uh, the term means. And now, obviously, we are trying to kind of see how this kind of change and branches into various facets of telehealth, whether it be in the form of a remote patient monitoring, whether it is form of virtual um, rehab, whether it is form of a mental health care clinic, whether it is in the form of telemedicine. So there are a lot of facets that are coming out of telerehabilitation. So what exactly are the modes of telehealth? It could be from clinician to clinician. It could be from clinician to patient. And like I said, it could be also in the form of an asynchronous mean where the patient's data get transferred based on what they are doing um, in terms of the remote uh, patient health monitoring systems. So what are some of the benefits of telehealth? Uh, in terms of practice, uh, you can reach out to underserved population. Um, we kind of sit in a very interesting location. Though I'm in California, there's a lot and a lot of population which is surrounded by uh, rural communities. And that is where we are trying to kind of reach out to those communities who are not able to access, uh, for example, the hospitals or the clinics in the city and how do you reach out to them? The other benefit of telehealth comes from delivering uh, in the form of preventive care. We don't always have to be in the reactive mode and get the patients when they, something has gone wrong. I think it is also important to see that if we can see these patients early on so that we are in that preventive mode, for example, in terms of obesity or in terms of diabetes or in terms of hypertension, uh, for example, managing them. So those are the things that we can work um, from a prevention standpoint. And finally, I think it is important to realize that sometimes our, our logistics keeps changing. And so if the patient cannot come in person, we should be able to give them that flexibility of providing virtual care. But every benefit comes with its in itself of its challenges. And some of the challenges, uh, obviously, we'll talk about in a few slides that comes along with telehealth. And it is up to us and the providers to see how we can navigate those challenges or overcome those challenges. In terms of global health or global tele telemedicine market, uh, it is going to go expand. Uh, we know that, I mean, obviously because of the pandemic, but our post-pandemic also, by 2027, we are talking about 71 billion uh, being spent on or, or potentially being spent in this market. So if we have resources available, I think it is for the healthcare providers to see how you can enrich your clinics or your facilities or your skills and leverage those skills through the aspect or the ability to use and make it into a telehealth clinic. So these are just numbers in terms of kind of going from various regions. And as you can see, you will find that from 2018 to now into it and, and moving to 2025, various obviously uh, continents, whether it is North America, Europe, Asia, everywhere, it's gonna be a growth that will keep happening in this region. So we will not have dearth of uh, 
I would say resources, it is up to us as to how to channel them and then how to prepare our students along the way so that they can be uh, the users of this technique. So let's see what are some telehealth based approaches out there. Uh, one interesting paper that I found was very interesting how they were using vi video tele rehab and how it was improving their quality of life. So the outcome measures that they used was in the form of two minute walk test, MOCA, which is for their mental health and the FIM scores to see whether they're functionally, how, what is improving in them. Another article talked about how the multidisciplinary team can work with different patient population. And in this particular case, they can improve uh, their hypertension and reduce, uh, for example, improving uh, using the uh, different techniques of managing hypertension to say. This was an interesting paper that came where they talked about how PTs, OTs, and SLPs, which is speech language pathologists, actually worked in an acute care setting and they helped in triaging to make sure that they had different tiers of which patient population should be seen for the direct therapy versus which can be seen by a hybrid model and which can be used only for pure telehealth. So the reason I'm showing this particular article is that we, as and when we are in healthcare sector, what we can do is we can also try and tr see what we can do to triage and make sure that if we have less providers and more patients, how we can capitalize on how we can use these patient population and be seen by providers uh, if they are not all of them are available to see to teach them. This was my clinic uh, and we kind of saw this patient with peripheral neuropathy. Um, and it was very interesting that sometimes we just assume that older population or um, our seniors will be technology aversive. On the contrary, I found this gentleman uh, and uh, people like him to be very receptive to it. But yes, you have to prepare them. Like for example, we, we gave them 16 sessions of telehealth session, but we made sure that the first session was just orientation. So we were just helping them use technology. And then I would get verbal consent now that you're recording. So just to kind of give you an right, example. Perfect, works for me. Did you do 20 more? So this was just an example to show how three physical therapy students were trying to train a client with stroke. And yes, the client did have a caretaker or a caregiver and that we were using to make sure that he was safe while doing this telehealth session. So uh, in a nutshell, it's important to make sure that our patients are safe in a telehealth session. So make sure you kind of use that uh, in terms of appropriateness. Who are your patients who can be treated to tele through telehealth? We were using uh, this Health in Motion app. Uh, this is a neurogaming company, which we were collaborating with. And after we were kind of done with giving synchronous telehealth, they, this was, they also had a feature in which they had an avatar who used to practice with the patient. And that's how you can use the remote patient monitoring technique. So you can log on the data. And interestingly, this particular patient that we saw, she logged in 19 hours of physical therapy that she was doing in asynchronously. So which was very encouraging for us. I think finally, I want to kind of get to the virtual reality aspect of it. We have ability to do a lot and lot of, I would say, motor examination. I'm not going to play the video, but all I'm trying to tell you here is that we can use the virtual reality also as part of our engaging our patients. So what are the challenges? Uh, one of them could be security breaches, and we have to make sure that we are working with our clients in a HIPAA uh, I would say compliant uh, feature. And then finally, I think it is about integrating virtual reality and augmented reality into artificial intelligence in telehealth. 
So I will not go into detail of what is, uh, we know that virtual reality is an immersive experience, but obviously the augmented reality is in terms of uh, reinforcing digital Im images on top of the meaningful interacting process. And then finally, I think it is up to us how we kind of use augmented reality where the clinicians can use them as an augmented reality setup for the clinician's toolkit. So they can see different patients as part of the, the Google glasses and the smart glasses that they can use and help people from different locations. This is an example of AI powered physical therapy. And finally, I wanted to talk about the role of interprofessional team. I think it is very important what we found that in terms of providing telehealth simulation, initially only 46% of the patients uh, or the students said that they are not exposed to telehealth. So I think I would leave at this particular note and say that we need more telehealth simulation type of exercises. Uh, in at Fresno State, where I teach, we were using a lot of um, PTs, nursing, and social work students who were working together to give a telehealth um, telehealth to a Parkinson's client, and we simulated this whole activity. But what is interesting that came out of this is we learned that not of most of our students, they don't have that experience. So I think it is important that we understand that we have to start it from the ground up, which is we have to educate our students, our faculty, and then we can get through the task forces or the healthcare professionals who are tele rehabs uh, savvy. So thank you for, for having me here. I think it's important to understand that for telehealth to become part of the ecosystem, you have to do a lot of planning that goes into it. And that's when we can reimagine, I would say, what we have set out for. So through human and technology collaboration, we can make a better experience for our uh, patients and and this we have to do start from teaching. So I think that's what my uh, agenda is to make sure for you to understand that we need a lot of curriculum changes to make sure that people understand the importance of telehealth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hajela, uh, for your introduction to what telerehabilitation is and or maybe telehealth is and the case studies on how we can actually integrate telehealth technologies to provide treatments for patients during the pandemic. And I do like the point that you pointed out uh, about educating uh, not only just the patients, but also the therapist itself to uh, make this happen, right? And yeah, so let's move on. Thanks, Jackson. So moving on, let's welcome Dr. Loring to her presentation on implement, implementing and optimizing health outcomes via telerehabilitation. Hi there, my name is Lauren Rashford and I currently work on product development with Motarin Technologies. Uh, my background is I'm a doctor of physical therapy and uh, started out in the orthopedic musculoskeletal space and quickly uh, realized through a number of different experiences, my passion really, um, you know, is, is with the neuro, neurologic population. And I've been um, both treating as a clinician and also um, in product development and patient experience side of things um, with neurologic patients for the last 10, 12 years. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking about implementing and optimizing health outcomes via telerehabilitation. And some quick uh, disclosures. Uh, I am currently VP of Product Development with Moterum. I'm also a shareholder and receive a salary with Moterum Technologies. So quickly, the learning objectives of this uh, by the end of this presentation, to be able to understand the barriers to telerehab, uh, thoroughly understand the fundamentals of key revenue generation with remote patient uh, monitoring, comprehend the specific coding requirements around RPM, discuss remote therapeutic monitoring codes, applying RPM and RTM to your clinical practice or community engagement, and then also clinician's perspective, optimizing remote treatment using RPM and RTM specifically with the neurologic 
population. So let's start with barriers to virtual care, right, or tele-rehab. So a major barrier of virtual care is, is the constant shift in regulations or guidelines. Uh, there may be federal guidelines, however, each state may also require additional rules and regulations around licensures, scope of practice, how to bill, um, for example, rendering provider versus incident to, which we'll talk about um, in a little bit. And if virtual care is even allowed in that state, based on your actual license, right? You could be a physical therapist in Massachusetts and have full uh, virtual care abilities. It's under your scope of practice through billing um, under your own NPI in Massachusetts, but you're unable to do that across states. Um, specifically, I believe Alabama is very difficult for physical therapists or occupational therapists to treat virtually. And then additionally, you have the insurers or the payors who have their own set of in-network or out-of-network provider eligibility. For example, with our company now, we provide health services uh, with physician services and therapy, PT, OT, speech therapy. We have some insurance companies such as Aetna, for example, that allows us, allows us to have out-of-network uh, physician service to be virtual. However, our therapists cannot see the patients virtually if those if that patient uh, does not have um, in-network um, benefits, for example. So there really are a lot of barriers at the federal and state and payor level that require constant eye and the ability to really pivot your business models and really stay on top of these things. Another barrier is technology adoption. So we know that 83% of people prefer telemedicine. However, the adaptability of it is really in our hands. We have to make it easy to use and, and more functional so that patients are compliant and that they have, you know, they believe that they are taking control of their overall health. So let's say you're setting up a remote patient monitoring like a blood pressure cuff and you're walking the patient through how to set up. Every little detail in that process really should be addressed beforehand. For example, you'd be surprised how many patients, right, don't know how to turn or where to find their Bluetooth, um, which usually you need that to be enabled, enabled to have the RPM. Um, processes all in place and, and streamlined. So it's our job to really be educators and help stabilize the stresses of, of tech adoption. For clinicians, the barrier isn't necessarily the technology itself, but rather how many systems, right? How many systems are in place? Having the capability to utilize a single sign-on, um, for example, can go a long way for clinicians so that it doesn't disrupt their workflow. So as you're implementing um, you know, different monitoring or tracking components to your care, or your services, um, the community, it's important to make sure that the clinicians, anything you do, you're constantly talking to them, getting that user experience from the clinician's perspective and making sure that things aren't disrupting their workflow. And then training and implementation. Find the right stakeholders, right? You have to start there. It's so critical to get those early adopters who help develop and set up detailed processes, your SOPs, um, right? So that when it comes to really launch your new model, it is a fairly seamless transition um, or else it, it will be really difficult to gain that traction. Opportunities to virtual care. There are many opportunities, right? Here are just a few that I've listed. Lifetime connection. So you have the ability, right, when you discharge someone from a hospital or a different setting, um, a skilled nursing facility, for example, and they go home, without these monitoring tools in place, there's, it's difficult to really maintain that connectivity, right? And so, so the virtual care, tele-rehab, remote patient monitoring, these tracking components, it really does allow us to stay connected to that patient and to their caregivers. Um, and it just brings us more, I guess, forth in that, in that community space. Um, improving access, right? Clinical support in rural communities and access to specialists. So the more we're able to really provide a greater scope or a greater realm of services um, through virtual care, we're able to reach so many people that we aren't necessarily able to reach through a brick and mortar facility. And then of course, the tracking and monitor. Uh, monitoring component to this is, is huge and really endless because not only is it a great revenue generation um, for an actual clinic and for an actual facility, but on the flip side of that, it's a win-win for both 
uh, the clinicians, right, the rehab, rehab centers, but also the patients and their caregivers, because you're really helping them take control of their health. You're really helping them maintain um, a better health status by giving them more tools to stay connected and stay monitored so that you can intervene or provide any type of uh, therapeutic intervention when necessary. So let's quickly just talk about what is remote patient monitoring, right? So let's start with the basics and get a good understanding on what exactly that RPM is. So the American Heart Association, um, you know, really defines RPM as something to help enable the management and monitoring your patients while providing health data such as physiologic parameters, such as blood pressure, pulse oximetry, heart rate, and glucometers, for example. The American Medical Association states that GATE, and as we all know, as a lot of therapists know, we consider this a sixth vital sign. Um, and they do consider GATE to also be a reimbursable physiologic parameter. So some basic requirements for successful remote patient monitoring reimbursement would include the fact that the data must be transmitted via an FDA approved device, which automatically stores and then transmits that data, meaning a patient for RPM cannot manually enter their data into any system. Medicare did ease up on some of these restrictions during COVID, but these are the permanent rules to RPM. Um, patients must also provide verbal consent prior to enrolling into the program. And then you must also have at least 16 readings each calendar month. So if you send a patient home with blood pressure, cough, and pulse oximeter, you cannot bill separately for each device. However, for the total component of those 16 readings, it can be a combination of those devices. And then lastly, the patient must be seen face-to-face -face within 12 months prior to enrollment, and then that has to resurface every 12 months. Why is RPM so important, and why should we consider implementing it into our practice or our healthcare system? Well, it's a great way to help manage your patients, especially the chronic neurologic population or the geriatric population, right? So, so many of the chronic neural population feel pushed aside after being discharged from their last bit of therapy and are somewhat really left trying to figure out what to do, especially the families as well. And a lot of these patients really regress or start to what we call plateau. Um, and there are so many ways to really keep them connected to different monitoring programs, including um, strong gait metrics and other program um, intensities that we'll discuss more in some later slides. But RPM really provides a sense of community. Build your brand. Don't let patients fall off after discharge. Keep them connected. You know, enhance that connectivity that wasn't really once there. You can really build a community of support um, through RPM. It also gives you leverage to really increase your overall outreach to patients who may not live close enough to come into your clinic, brick and mortar, for example, um, or those who maybe just struggle in general to get to you face to face. Combining telehealth, telerehab, RPM, you can provide so many more opportunities to patients. So patient data, that's another huge component and, and you know, uh, provides a lot of value um, within RPM significant data and analytics that you can dive into by monitoring these patients with different comorbidities. For example, everything from gait data to other physiologic parameters to help you provide more therapeutic interventions to either increase intensities or, or modify when necessary. Patients want to use this technology. Um, so 83% of uh, people I, I discussed earlier in the slide want to use Tele-rehab, well, even more detail, 67% of individuals in the chronic neural subset, like stroke and Parkinson's, for example, and their caregivers want to use this technology, if anything, so that they can just stay more on top of their health. Um, that's a really important statistic for us to remember. And it's really, again, our job to help educate and really enhance these programs, um, you know, that we're providing or these opportunities for these patients. And then lastly, escalation pathways, right? You can customize within your own practice or health system based on how you want to implement RPM, for example, and how to effectively triage the data and alerts coming through. So by providing these effective escalation pathways, you're improving the overall health outcomes. 
And then lastly, the revenue uh, return on investment, ROI. It's a great revenue stream um, with RPM and remote therapeutics, which we talk about. Typically averages out to about 135 a patient per month. And then this is just a quick slide breaking down the RPM codes uh, for you. And, and we'll, we can share this slide certainly so that you have these, these CBT codes. Um, so remote therapeutic monitoring. Um, this is fairly new, and there's a lot of push for this because physical therapists or occupational therapists were not considered eligible um, to bill RPM. That had to be under a physician's um, or nurse practitioner, for example. Anyone who provides e evaluation management codes or services was who could bill um, for RPM. So RTM is a way for therapists um, to really be able to bill under their own NPI or their own, their, their own entity. And with RTM, it's reimbursement for musculoskeletal or respiratory for right now. Um, you can look at things like therapy, medication adherence and response, and then also pain levels. Uh, and again, this is a great way to really um, be able to step in and provide any type of therapeutic intervention um, when needed for patients. If you have a platform, for example, that's keeping track of um, their home exercise program, their medications. Do they have pain today? Did they have pain after their exercise? All of these things can be billed and um, reimbursed. So applying monitoring codes to your practice. Number one is, you know, what is your need? Is it increased revenue, patient satisfaction, clinician satisfaction? Maybe you want to expand your services or your areas of service. Um, that's really important to just identify that need and then identify the key stakeholders and the early adopters. Set your goals, um, which we'll talk about in a minute, and then implement and execute, right? It's all about the execution from the implementation. So it's so important to spend time up front developing your SOPs, developing your workflows with those early adopters so that when you do go to launch it, you're able to provide as much of a seamless transition as possible. The assessment and treatment uh, optimization. So how can we really utilize RPM to modify plan or provide therapeutic or clinical interventions? So wearable gait sensors, uh, for example, can significantly help monitor the complexities of neural gait patterns, for example, including compensatory strategies, asymmetries, step stride length, cadence, speed, and more. Uh, retrieving or receiving that raw data from patients while walking in their own home environment can be very powerful. This can really help target treatments based on the gate sensor output. You can see in this image, some of the information that can be beneficial um, and really supporting not only medical necessity, but also in general, your progression of the patient by really breaking down the stance and, and stride variables, for example. And this information really isn't just helpful to clinicians, but imagine if you could show a visualization like this to your patient. Um, providing the opportunity to visualize the gait mechanics in such a way like this really does help them become more cognizant and really aware of their gait as they're walking, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis in their own home environment or out in the community. And then here's just another quick example, breaking down in further detail step and uh, stance variable variabilities. And for example, let's just quickly dive into falls risk assessment and the ability to what we call uh, stratify falls risk with wearable gait sensors. So one in three individuals over the age of 65 experience one or more falls in any given year. And this prevalence increases to 40% for individuals aged 80 years and older. As we know, falling often leads to severe injuries um, and you know, it's really rippling effect uh, from there. So hospitalizations, loss of autonomy, and ADLs, IADLs, reduced quality of life. Uh, working in the neural space, we also know that individuals with cognitive impairments or gait abnormalities fall twice as often as their unimpaired peers and have a threefold increase of suffering of bone fracture after a fall. Again, leading to hospital readmission. So exercise interventions and fall prevention are promising as they are associated with uh, you know, as they are associated um, 
with improved um, gait metrics and hopefully lowering that overall risk of, um, of falling and rehospitalization. The recognition of specific gait metrics, such as will we have a double limb support stance, can be analyzed. And double limb support stance, for example, we know that if a patient's time in double limb support stance is increasing, they're at a much higher risk of falling. And that could be a key indicator to provide a therapeutic intervention, get someone out of the home, get a therapist on the phone, um, set up a visit, any type of proactive, you know, um, interventions that we can do is going to help the overall or lower, lower the overall risk of that patient having to be rehospitalized and really continue to decrease their quality of life. Um, so the ability to really collect gait data specific to falls risk, especially within the neurologic population, can really reduce the risk of your patients having a fall. And then in general, monitoring exercise tolerance. So this is really where our TM codes can really be powerful, right? By utilizing, um, really leveraging your treatment optimization and truly tailoring your sessions to your patients based on their overall activity tolerance uh, thresholds. The level of evidence to support these systems is variable and the uh, evaluation of remote wearable monitoring system has been largely limited really to inpatient setting. So as overall healthcare burden increases and more patients want care at home, there's definitely more and more interest in the application um, of remote monitoring uh, during activity exercises in a remote setting or in their home setting. So real-time monitoring, as we talked about, can really help you as a therapist target the intensity of those treatments, uh, you know, and imagine just how helpful in your treatment plan and modification if you're a clinician of that plan would be if you could remotely analyze in real time or going back and looking if you know your patient you set up a home exercise program or you wanted to see their sleep schedule, for example, um, having that information come in, their heart rate, oxygen levels, blood pressure, um, being able to monitor your patients heart rate live during a virtual session, for example, allows you to really safely challenge those thresh thresholds uh, with your supervision. And uh, so to conclude, you know, there are really endless opportunities to leverage your practice or your devices and, and overall services to provide um, a wealth of what I call holistic care to your patients and the community. We have to definitely continue to advocate and push for continued pro progression in this space, but we have already seen more and more people and more communities afforded, uh, you know, more opportunities for, for care and just a greater wealth of um, expanded health services. So thank you so much uh, for your time today and please feel free to reach out to me uh, directly. I would like to uh, thank to thank Lauren for the presentation. Um, definitely val very valuable information on the implementation of tele rehab into the U.S. healthcare system. Very nice details on what constitutes reimbursement parameters for remote patient therapeutic monitoring, and I really like the emphasis on early adoption to develop the initial workflow for tele rehab is definitely a field that has a lot of room to grow. Um, yeah. All right. So finally, let us welcome Professor Minos to his presentation on the technical challenges of the remote clinical use of rehabilitation robots. All right, the stage is yours, Prof Minos. Hello. Uh, thank you everyone for being here in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evenings. And uh, I am uh, Minos New, Transi Minos New from uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University. I work at uh, Reijing Hospital. Uh, I work in a clinical department of rehabilitation medicine, and I'm on the faculty of, of the rehab team. I work on a day to day basis with uh, physical therapists and uh, PMNR uh, physiatrists, the, the, the doctors, uh, since many, many years ago till now. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to talk about some technical challenges uh, when uh, potentially when here in, in, in China, in Shanghai, when we also have to deal with uh, remote uh, tele-rehabilitation. 
I am an engineer by trade, um, but uh, uh, we work very closely between the clinical setup and uh, the technological developments. And uh, today, in the next uh, 10 minutes or so, I'd like to pinpoint uh, ourselves to a um, goal and the sets of uh, challenges around it. Now, our goals are the same, to enable remote clinical services and research of rehabilitation. Now, the reasons are obvious. Um, the Ever since the days when internet was available, uh, the idea of uh, hooking up internet with some sort of uh, um, let's say human-to-human uh, -human interaction in a, in, a, in a clinic has been uh, thought uh, well over again by researchers and uh, technolo technology developers. Um, and uh, for clinical services, our two pre previous guests have covered very well. Uh, I'd like to highlight a little bit on the research side of things because usually in the research setup, we have higher requirements on the instruments we use. Usually requires higher bandwidth. We talk about data. It sometimes requires not high reliability, but reliability is usually low. So you would uh, keep an eye out uh, for the, for devices not to crash. Um, so uh, the challenges with using uh, devices in the clinical setup, here I'm specifically talking about robots. Uh, I um, kind of categorized them into three uh, three ranks. Now, the first one is I call the non-fungible delay, which is caused by the real world, which is caused by the physics. Now, thinking about two um, robots uh, being connected in some ways across the globe, now, just because the the, the planet Earth is big. And traveling between two spots, let's say the two farthest spots on the globe, for instance, like a, uh, Beijing on the other side of the globe is uh, Buenos Aires in Argentina. The transmission delay round trip is about 130 milliseconds. Even if everything is traveled in the speed of light, and even if <clears throat> there is a direct fiber optic connection between those two cities, you still have, we still have well over 130 millisecond transmission delay. And that is way above the, uh, let's say the uh, threshold uh, delay that people can realize, can, can uh, perceive. So this is non-fungible means that there's no uh, technology that can uh, dismiss this delay because it can remove this delay. The best thing we could do is to not, the second point is not add another uh, non-essential delay not to add some, not to make it any, any worse. But in many scenarios, we see if we really do a round trip connection between, let's say, uh, Shanghai and the other side of the globe, you will see way higher delay than 130 milliseconds. It's usually, that's because it's not very uh, practical to have a fiber optic direct connection between these two cities. And we have to have uh, wires, cables, devices, the routers. And anytime you have a router connecting, uh, relaying uh, several parts, we add delay. So easily we double that, triple that. Now the second part is network jittering, uh, which is which is worse than a non-fungible delay. Uh, we, if we can predict the delay and uh, have devices act around it, that's, that's not so bad. But the worst thing is that we all experience bad connections, the hiccups. Now, those two things, those the, the, in this category, means that um, the the uh, transmission delay is unpredictable. So you build a lot of things, you you allocate resources around these um, connections, but uh, occasionally the network gets ten times worse, as if you lose connections. And in the robot setup, we cannot afford having those situations because robots, unlike the chatting bot, it's connected at all times. And any instance, if the device or the algorithm detects that the two devices are uh, disconnected, that may either cause very bad user experiences. In a worst case scenario, it renders the robots unstable. It rattles or it just flies out which we call being unstable. It may hurt our patients. 
So dealing with this kind of delay, especially the jittering and the delay, unpredict, uncertainty, unpredictability of the delay, it's essentially important. Now, the third category I call missed sync, which means, so there's a, there's a, a long standing quandary between if we have multiple clocks sitting in one room, it's been known quandary between having all the clocks ticking together versus knowing when they tick. So either you have all the clocks tick together, but you don't know when, or you know exactly when you're gonna have all those clocks tick, but you just cannot have them tick together. And this is a common problem caused by multiple devices you have to sync. Now, and the root cause of that is devices starting at various times. When they're starting, I, I meant both. I meant both um, the devices will be turned on at the same time. And then in other scenario, which means the devices will start collecting data at different times. And uh, it's not, um, it's hard to imagine, it's not difficult to imagine that we have a series of data recording devices. Some are robots, some are different, let's say EMG, uh, data collection devices. You have to start this one by one. And the starting sequence actually makes all these devices starting at a different steps. And taken together, we will have a hard time knowing that uh, which one leads what by how much. So all these three things taken together gives us, gives us um, many problems and challenges to solve when we want to hook up um, powerful tools such as uh, rehabilitation robots together. And these problems are more prominent with robots, but it doesn't mean that it's non-existent for things like uh, cell phones. It's the same. It's true for any electronic devices nowadays if we want to uh, hook them up together. All right, I'm going to introduce two small examples that we, uh, how we tackle these problems at Raging Hospital in, uh, in, in Shanghai. Now, this is a classic example uh, of doing the upper uh, extremity training with patients. Now, this in the screen you see is a, a Fourier um, uh, arm Motus M2 Pro robot. Now, the patient is trying to do the arm um, uh, reaching movements. Uh, you see a lot of uh, trunk compensation. I'm not showing using this video to show a good or correct uh, posture of doing the movement. And this is just a real scene that the patients, no matter what, even if there's a there's a, a physician standing by him uh, and re keep reminding him of the wrong uh, trunk compensation, he could still he could uh, he just couldn't uh, restrict from uh, refrain from uh, leaning forward. Now think about the situation happening during in the in the uh, remote setup. You don't have a clinician standing by the patient. The best thing we can do at this moment with the technology is to um, cast several cameras around this patient and to keep reminding him or her that you're doing something wrong. Uh, we don't have the ability yet to pat on the shoulder. We don't have the ability yet to um, to let's say put some um, restrictive manners. Uh, of uh, on the patient's body. So all these things eventually somehow uh, will resort to some sort of uh, robotic um, approaches to be applied in the clinical setup. Now, the uh, situation that I talked about, the three categories that I talked about also arise in this situation. Now, the first is look at, just look at the sheer amount of signals that's been generated that's available to us as clinician or as clinical researchers during the process. Just for this art reaching movement, we have at least four or five uh, sources, different modalities of data. We have the brain uh, activity that can be scanned by uh, the FNIRS. It's just a, a rehab friendly version of the bolt signal detector. And we have full body motion capture that uh, detects the joint, the trunk uh, compensation, and then the joint uh, mobility, joint um, range of motion. We have the surface uh, electromyography, the EMG, that captures the muscle activation. And we also have uh, occasionally, very often nowadays, the uh, robot itself that can record a lot of data for, um, for ourselves. Now, these things will naturally bring the one category of uh, delay problem that I talked a little earlier, which is the uh, synchronization problem. 
Now, uh, this is the this is the uh, illustration of what happens what, when, uh, in reality, if we have all the devices sitting in one room, which means it doesn't introduce the artificial non-predictable delay, then usually for a, a, sing, a very simple movement, if we record the trajectory, which is the point to point movement, smooth movement, and the EMG of the agonist, then uh, the natural pattern of that is the agonist should lead the uh, rapid increase of the trajectory. And usually you will see the onset of DMG. And after about a good 20 to 30 milliseconds, you will see the ramp up in the uh, movement displacement. Now, if we start the devices at wrong timing, and uh, very often than not, you will see the uh, blue trace, which is the um, high latency. What you see is the movement, the um, activation in the EMG actually starts after the uh, ramp up of the direct trajectory, which is not only wrong, but unpredictably wrong. Uh, if the delay can be known for sure, then it's okay. But if what if the devices are not in the same uh, room or it's not started in the same uh, sequence or there's a hiccup around these delay, then it makes it very difficult. Now, this has not been new to uh, televariabilitation. The synchronization between devices has been an issue ever since the day of the electrical comp electronic computers. And then people went to start using them uh, for data collection. Now, uh, but in the rehab setup, we have some uh, specific requirements to ourselves, uh, which is the devices we want to sync is kind of different. And also the sampling rate, which means how many times, how many samples, how many data points we can get for a, uh, let's say within one second. Now, uh, the devices that I showed you earlier, the f uh device has about 10 hertz of data collection rate, which means every second is going to give us spit out 10 um, data points. But for EMG, it can easily go to 2000. So you can see the drastic difference between the sampling rates and synchronizing these uh, different categories of device in terms of the sampling rate poses a different challenge I think somewhat specific to the uh, uh, rehabilitation uh, clinical setup. Now, uh, what we are doing in uh, uh, Reijin is to develop uh, a, pro uh, a um, open source library uh, or application uh, internally coded X engine, uh, made subject to change in the names. Uh, but what it does is to uh, solve that particular issue, which is to somehow have a way to know um, uh, the the relative delays between uh, devices when they start the collecting data, uh, even across different, even uh, when the data are, the devices are not in the same room when they're remotely operated. Now, um, uh, this is slightly different. This is uh, for uh, synchronizing devices across uh, uh, different rooms. Now, when we manage to do that, the one thing we can have is to have data collection on, in the background without worrying too much about their uh, synchronizations. But we also want to um, use these two devices in the same time, as if, for instance, this is a, uh, a, a cartoon of two uh, robots um, operating in separate rooms. Uh, just a demonstration of that. Now think of the situation, what could happen? Now we could have one patient, on, a patient on one side and then the caregiver on the other side that becomes a uh, tele-assessment or even tele-intervention. Um, uh, now, if we have two clinicians on the both sides, this easily turns into a uh, training setup. Now we have two patients on both sides that becomes the concept, the idea of group therapy. In all these variations, we would want somehow the devices to uh, work together with each other, but this will subject to all kinds of, uh, all three kinds of delays that I talked about in the first slide. Now, uh, so with uh, several um, technical developments that we want to uh, develop. So in this scenario, the most prominent problem with that is the jittering of the network. It's difficult to demonstrate the jittering of this thing. Well, what I'm showing here is after we've solved this problem, what may happen? The In the big picture, you see um, 
right? You see what a person can do in one uh, room. And in the inset of that, the uh, lower right corner, you see what happens in the other room, which is uh, two kilometers apart. Uh, what you see after you've solved the somehow improved the, the latency uh, jittering issue, uh, you could see a smooth transition between the uh, devices and then the hand. Oh, now, yes, you see in the one room, the device bumps into a uh, real hand. In the other room, uh, the rubber band, the clinician will feel that. And it's it's not the artificial um, mocked uh, resistance. It's actually the resistance sensed from a person in another room. And all these things will not be available if we have a way of transmitting uh, signals across distances. And also I'm telling, um, I'm sharing, what I'm sharing here is that the jittering will kill the whole performance. And it's not like that the, the thing will feel uh, sluggish or uh, unreal. It would just like uh, somehow halt the entire application. All right, um, the technology uh, enabling that is um, has something to do with a prediction and a rollback, which is in essence some error tolerance um, algorithms that allows the jittering to be canceled, which is, um, I'm not going to run into the details of that. Um, but all in all, uh, what I want to uh, emphasize here again is that um, if this is the trend, the teleoperation, then um, we have to, we better um, confront the challenges early and often. Lucky that uh, we do have some um, tools in our arsenal to deal with these and we've been uh, working on it. And, and the uh, responsibility is shared between um, clinicians and uh, uh, developers and tech, um, technologists. Uh, and let's uh, try our best to um, to redeem our expectation uh, for this rehabilitation technology. Maybe uh, baby steps at first, but I personally believe that for rehabilitation, which has a, a very good background uh, and uh, paved the way, uh, we should be able to uh, show our um, uh, patients a more uh, promising future. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Minos, for your presentation on the challenges of telerehabilitation in the use of the robotics. I uh, really like the idea of you showing the physical part, uh, not physical, but physics part of how the telerehabilitation actually works internally on communicating from one robotic to another robotic. So um, we should now move on to the Q&A session. All right, so... Uh, then I would start off with the first question from the Q&A box that was uh, answered mm. by Dr. Nopu. Uh, on to you, Daniela. Okay, first I just want to thank again all of our speakers for sharing and thanks to you, our audience, for your time and attention. And the first question from the chat box for Dr. Uh, Hajela, um, can we know what do you see is the key rehab technology? Um, that means like robotics, sensors, technology, virtual reality, et cetera, to make the tele-rehabilitation a success. Yeah, thank you for asking this question. I think um, in terms of, uh, there are many technologies that are coming into the space and obviously it's about standardization and making sure the credibility and obviously the reliability and validity of the tools. But nevertheless, I feel I'm very optimistic in terms of trying things as a researcher. And I'm seeing that in terms of virtual reality, XR, XR Health actually is using virtual reality in tele rehab. So that is something I think would be very interesting how they are using the platform. And um, I know that there are different companies, whether it's Sword Health, whether it's Fern Health, um, uh, they are using a lot of tele rehab. Uh, and it will be interesting to see how the future of tele rehabilitation changes in, in the due course. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Hajela. I um, actually wanted to have a follow-up questions on that, but what do you see the actual the challenges of doing research on using VR itself um, in telerehabilitation? 
Is this question for me? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a question for you. Can you repeat the question? Uh, what are the what are the challenges that you would uh, foresee on doing research on VR in telerehabilitation? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. I think we are, as we understand, there are many facets to it. So when you talk about VR, the challenges would lie whether it can translate into the environments that would be like, if we are talking about the virtual environment, whether that is in sync with what, for example, the patient uh, would like to work on and their interest also. Suppose if you make a VR technology and the game uh, in terms of picking something in a virtual environment. And if we know that functionally that is not relevant to the patient, then there is a mismatch in terms of the outcomes that you may be able to get. So I think that is one of the challenges is how do you standardize things? How do you make sure that they are reliable and they translate into functional outcomes? So I think that is my one uh, advice to people who are building VR technology for telehealth is to see when you make the product, how does that translate into the functionality uh, in terms of that particular client? For example, if you're working with Parkinson's client, how can it help in somebody in freezing of gait versus if you're working with somebody with a stroke client and they have issues with motor control, how do you change the dynamics of the game in a virtual world? Thank right. you. Thanks, uh, uh, thanks Dr. Hajela. Um, all right, so actually there's one question for uh, Prof Minos over here. Actually, there's quite a few, but we're running out of time. So let's just maybe answer this one first uh, from, for Prof Minos, all right? So one of the goal uh, to have telerehabilitation is to make the rehabilitation more accessible to the rural areas of potentially less developed country. So in your opinion, what do you foresee the potential of telerehabilitation in these areas, especially their network infrastructure is underdeveloped and not as strong as the more developed countries? Yes, I just uh, typed in my uh, answers on the, uh, in, the in, in Zoom. Uh, right. I think I'll just repeat that uh, with the three challenges that I talked about, I think will be more realistic to introduce telerehab for assessments and teaching. Um, that being said, um, doing this, uh, what I talked about is um, the tele rehab using robots for intervention might still be challenging. It's just the simple truth that uh, the, the delays and then all these uh, uh, potential uh, control issues is not that easy to be solved. Uh, I'm, talk I'm not even talking about uh, the uh, payment system, uh, who will take the responsibility and who will uh, be charged uh, if we don't have a physician next to the person. It's 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 a problem that every um, uh, economy needs to solve by itself. Now, I might be uh, a little bit conservative about what I just said. Um, I If I were to bring out a more optimistic view uh, uh, is that, um, in because I think the question is specifically asked about developing countries, um, less developed. So uh, the, 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 the uh, examples or the landscape in China is that uh, people, the patients are more, are quite receptive uh, to the new technology and robots. And that's good news. So if they see um, a, let's say uh, uh, a training room, a, th uh, a therapy room with uh, mostly devices, but a few or a few um, clinicians there, they don't get scared or they don't get uh, uh, reasonably uh, annoyed. Uh, they feel like this is a place filled with technology, so they, they, they want to walk in. So on the bright side, this will potentially help uh, the, um, let's say, the, um, the spread, the reach of the technology to our potential people. All right. Thank you, Prof. Minos. All right. So I um, actually want to thank everyone today for joining us uh, for our second of the four webinars of Summer Series Edition. And we hope that you have enjoyed and learned from the experts on the uh, on today's panels. Uh, this session is recorded and will be available on our Motors Academy channel on YouTube. So you may also find other recordings from previous webinars there too. So we would like you to uh, grow our platform, subscribe and like our videos as well. So we would like to bring this to your attention. So on the left, of this poster is to our next webinar and which will be on the 2nd of June with the topic of virtual reality, augmenting experience in functional therapy. And we have Dr. Faza 
Akhtar Hanapia, Professor Fernando Wendelin, and also Brandon Hill as our panelists. So the link for the registration is provided in the chat box. So if you go to the chat box, you'll see there's a link over there. While on the right side of the poster, we have the QR code that leads you to the feedback form where you will also find a section to fill your name in for certification uh, that will be issued for your particip participation. All right. So we appreciate your time and effort to fill this uh, feedback form. And any questions directed to Lauren during the Q&A session will be sent to her to answer. And we will direct you back to answer uh, via email. So for now, goodbye, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.